Hey guys and welcome to the third episode of this tutorial series where I teach you how to make your own bullet hell in Game Maker Studio 2. Today's episode will be centered on animating the player character. The art of a game serves many purposes. For one, it gives the game an atmosphere with environment designs that instill emotions within players, and character art which helps the player know how to view an NPC, letting them relate to these random 2D bots on the screen. However, the main purpose of art that relates to what we're discussing here is showing the player what they're doing or supporting the functionality of the game. Animations show the player what is happening and how they're affected by the game world by pressing buttons. But who am I to tell you how to do this? This is Caden's job. So this video will really just explain how we do this in Game Maker. Usually when people make their first game, they have separate sprites for every direction the character goes in. This works quite well for smaller projects, but for the scale of our game, we're going to have to condense things a bit. Therefore, we're going to have to have all the different directions in a single sprite, using a bit of simple maths and cleverness. Now we know how to not quickly clutter our project with sprites, how do we actually determine which sprite we use? For this we use a state machine. This is essentially a way for the game to tell what the player is doing. So an example of a state would be idle or dashing. In order to implement this though, we need some sort of idea how all these states interact with each other. For this I made a diagram of sorts. This diagram explains all the interactions between the states we're going to have in our game. I'm going to quickly run through this so you understand how it works. We start off with the player being in an idle state. If any of the movement keys are pressed, we go to the walking state. From here, we either go back to the idle state if the movement keys are released, or if the dash key is pressed, we begin the dash by going into its beginning state. We split the dash into these different states because the player is vulnerable at the beginning and end state of the dash, whereas the player only has iframes during its main state. Moving on, each dash state is separated by different timers before returning to either its idle or walking state. Now we know how each of these pieces work, I can show you what I have done in order to implement this in Game Maker. So now that we are in Game Maker itself, I can show you the end product of this video. If I run this, you'll see that I have Cajun's character sprites that he showed in his video now up and working in the game. While moving and also idle, the player will always look at the mouth, but when it's dashing, the player will switch to the direction it's currently moving in. Now, let's get into how this works. This small part of the code decides whether the player is in its idle or walking state, but only if it's not dashing. If we relate this to the state machine, it will be the top left part that has the idle and walking states. To check whether it's moving, we do a simple if-else statement that checks whether any of the movement keys are pressed. If either of the movement keys are pressed, the game knows that you are walking, so you go into the walking state, else you would go into the idle state. Now let's look at how the dash works. I've changed this section only a bit, so now it incorporates all the different stages of dashing. You can only dash while you're moving, because that way we can actually tell where you want to dash to. Therefore, we can check if the player is in the walking state to dash. Also, when you dash, you first go into the wind up state, dash begin, and the alarm for the dash is now set to a different variable, the wind up duration. This is because as we'll see, the alarm now changes between the different dash states as well as ending the dash. Another change to the dash section is that the speed changes depending on the different stages in the dash. For example, the wind up and recovery stages are slower than the main state. This is done with a switch statement which I like to see as a nice replacement for a long chain of if else statements. How it works is that you put the variable you want to check next to the switch line, which for us would be the states. Then you have as many cases as you want, which would be like the output of the entire switch statement, depending on the variable given. In our case, we have a switch statement that has three different outputs. In the case that is dash begin, we run the code in that section and use a break at the end to break out of the switch statement, continuing on with the code. The same goes with the other cases, as well as switch statements in general. The alarm has had a bit of a makeover, with another switch statement in it. What this does is that depending on where the player is in its dash, it will move on to the next state, so wind up state to main state to recovery, and then ending the dash by going back to either the idle or walking state. 
How it does this is that in the cases that the dash hasn't ended and has moved to the next state, it simply sets an alarm for itself. Technically, if we had no break condition, it would go on forever, but in the case of dash end, we break out of this cycle. All this previous code was for setting up the state machine, so that we can use it for animating our character and potentially other things further down the line. Now here's the actual bit this video was centred around, the animation. Firstly, we use a switch statement to determine what sprite the player should be based on its state. However, to check for the dash, I use an if statement to check if the state has a word dash in its name. This way I don't need three extra cases in the switch statement, and the code looks slightly cleaner. The next section looks a bit more complicated, so I'll explain it in more depth. What we want out of these next lines is to get the direction of the mouse relative to the player, but more generalised, for example the mouse being left or right to the player. However, in our case a player is four-sided, meaning that we need to determine if the mouse is to the left, right, above and below the player. But in order to actually generalise it, we must first get the direction the mouse is to the player, which is what this point direction function is for. Now we divide it to get four different values to represent the four different sides the mouse can be on relative to the player. So we divide the mouse direction by 90 to get those values. But this raises another problem. If we think about this in terms of borders, we want these borders to be on the diagonal to get the directions we want. However, our borders are on the vertical and horizontal, meaning that the values show the direction the mouse is on the diagonals, so top left, top right and so on. Therefore, before dividing it, we actually have to change the mouse direction by an offset of 45 degrees. This doesn't actually change the borders though, technically they are still on the straights. But now that we are using the new offsetted value, the number we get out of it changes. This is because we can rotate the entire diagram by 45 degrees, and if we do that, you notice that our offsetted value actually lines up with the actual mouse direction. So the direction is the same, but the borders are now where we want it, on the diagonals. So now we know how this works in general, let's relate this to the actual code in the game maker. First, the variable mouse direction gets the direction of the mouse to the player. Then mouse side does what we explained previously, turns the variable mouse direction into a representation of the general direction of the player in relation to the mouse. For our purposes, 1 is right, 2 is up, 3 is left and 4 is down. However, it doesn't exactly return that. Since GameMaker sees 0 degrees being to the right, right is actually separated into the right side above 0 and the right side below 0. This is because we minus our initial direction by 45, which works for other directions, but it does result in negative numbers when the initial direction is less than 45, and also messes it up if it's between 360 and 315. So in order to fix this, we can simply check with an if statement whether it's either of the wrong values and just set it to 1, what we want. This next section involves slightly more maths, but it should all be quite simple. The purpose of these boundaries is to set the section we need. Because we have all the directions in one sprite, these sections should be the animation in the direction we want. I'll call this a sub-animation. For this, all we need to do here is get the upper and lower boundaries of the sub-animation using some more maths. The floor division just returns the length of the sub-animation, and by multiplying it by the mouse side, the value we were calculating earlier, we can get the upper boundary. The lower boundary is more of the same, only that we take one away from the mouse side before multiplying it by that floor division. So it's almost like the upper boundary of the previous sub-animation. However, the player only does this in walking and idle state, because when it's dashing, instead of looking towards the mouse, the player would rather look where it's going instead of at the mouse. Also in our case, I have the entire dash in one sprite, with a frame for each of its stages. Therefore, I use another switch statement to determine which stage in the dash it is. Rather than changing the boundaries, I directly change the image index, which is the current frame the sprite is on. Therefore, there is no animation, just individual frames. Inside each case of the switch statement, it's essentially the same thing, with a different offset to account for each stage in the frame. The first bit of the line is the same floor division to find the length of each section only now we multiply by another floor division. This one's very similar to what we had earlier that turned our mouse direction into a more general value to represent the different general directions. 
This time, we just plug the player direction into it without an offset, and that gives us what we want. A value from 1 to 4 to show the direction the player is currently moving in. Finally, we have two if statements to check if the player's current frame is above or below what we need and just sort of corrects it. But this is only for animations, cause for Dash remember we have individual frames being on each stage. This just about covers everything in the video, so if I run it once more hopefully you can understand how all of this works. If you don't, feel free to ask in the comments section. But for now, I'll see you in the next video.